This morning, I'm continuing. This will be the final message on my series that love is greater than. And we started with love is greater than sin. The gospel has this amazing supernatural power when articulated correctly to break through all of the pain and the discouragement that people carry and bring us to a place of yanking out the root of our fallen nature and placing the seed of Christ in us. It is a root change that changes behavior that overcomes the, the fruit that we see. I gave the illustration of a, of a fruit tree. Just beating all of the fruit and all the leaves off that tree is not going to change it from what it is. But if we can change the root, it will produce different fruit. And so love is greater than sin. We all deal with sin. And last week, we talked about love is greater than my past. How many were encouraged last week as we discovered or at least solidified again that it's behind me, it's what's in front of me that God is concerned about, living today, not living in yesteryear or days gone by. And if you are interested or you desire a DVD or CD on that, we have several CDs available of that particular message based on the uh, response that we got from you at our Connection Center. There are no costs. You can have those even if you want to give one away. Uh, We just want to sow that message. And this week, we're going to dive into the topic of love is greater than my way. And I'm going to confess to you that this particular topic is one that I'm probably most hypocritical about. I know I'm not alone. I'm not trying to live in a condemned space. But if we're honest with ourselves, our struggle is real. That we try. We want things to be different. We want things to be better. We're pursuing things. and, And many of us struggle by doing it the way that we think we should do it or valuing our own opinion about it or thinking that we've got a better way. And the reality is that God is love. That's why we've entitled that love is greater than my way. John, 1 John 4, 8 says that he not only loves us, but he is love. And God has a better way for your life to get you to a place of success, to a place of breakthrough and wholeness. If we talk about the, the core needs of every given person, three distinct words that I think apply not only to you and I, but to all creation. It's, it's these three things that each one of us desire to have approval. Each one of us desire to have acceptance and every one of us at our core want to be valued. Not only to be valued, but feel like we bring value to others. The desire for us to be significant, the desire for us to make a difference and feel loved is something that we all share. And because it's such a, a, a demanding emotion, such a demanding part of our lives, it also opens up a door to danger for each one of us. And what is the danger? That we begin to strive, strive for acceptance, strive for approval, strive to be significant. And the problem is that when you strive, you actually undermine your significance. Why is that bad? Why is striving for significance bad? Well, let me just read to you what the definition of striving is, to struggle or to fight for vigorously. And I want to tell you that this Christian life is not just difficult. It is impossible apart from the grace of God. Can I get an amen on that? So we, we, we fall into this danger of striving for, thinking that we're going to uh, you know, get someplace with it, when, when actually what we find when we head down that path is it undermines our significance because you, you aren't significant. I'm not significant just because I want to be. We are significant when we obey what God says. And uh, here's the ouchy word. Obedience is rooted in significance. Obedience is one of them words that, man, just saying it makes you go, oh, where's he going with this, right? How many would agree, if you are familiar with the scriptures, that Moses was a significant player in the Old Testament? Yet, if you know the rest of the story, he was a runaway Egyptian with a stuttering issue, hiding out on the backside of the desert. He wasn't significant until he obeyed what God said to do. And when he obeyed God, now significance flowed into his life because he listened. And when we talk about obeying, being, the, being rooted in significance, there's only two reasons why you and I would obey. Fear or love. Let me give you an example. Let's just make it real. There is a law that I'm required to wear a seatbelt. And the reason I wear my seatbelt isn't because I love having it on. I'm just afraid I'm going to get a ticket if I don't. And so I obeyed that law. Okay, that's not entirely true. I actually get tired of hearing the ding, 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 ding that my car does. But I wear the seatbelt because I'm afraid of the the outcome of what will happen. 
The same is true with why we obey when it's rooted in love, except for fear is the worst motivator of all because with fear, there's torment. And, and people, you and I, will only live under a place of obedience on fear for so long before your, your nervous system, the very core of who you are, you won't take it anymore. You can't take it anymore. You'll fall apart. Uh, it may lead you to a very dark place, even an end of your own life. So fear is a horrible motivator. We've been trying to use fear within church for decades or centuries, and it doesn't work. But love, on the other hand, totally different. Love is the best motivator because it empowers, it motivates, and beyond that, it sustains. It sticks with you. It's not just an emotion. It's a power that we have. It, it draws us into a place of source of, of that we can only find in Christ. So going back to the, the topic here, that love is greater than my way. And I've already stated that all of us have a, a desire to have acceptance and approval and value. So much so that many of us begin to lust for it. Oh, but we don't call it that. No, 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 no. We say stuff like, no, we're grinding. No, we're hustling. No, we're moving and shaking. But the reality it is we're lusting for it because we have to have it. Now, someone right now is going, I thought lust had something to do with sex. It does in part, but that's not limited to what lust is. Lust, by definition, is an overpowering appetite, desire, or craving. Now, I know none of you in this service, because you all are holier than, than most and more pure than the wind-driven snow, but some other service this weekend, and certainly some other church, but there are people that lust for power. There are people that lust for money. They crave it. They desire it. It's an overwhelming sense. And it's true that we also lust for approval and, a, and a lust for value and significance. And when you lust for something, that, that's something that you must have, it actually begins to unravel and destroy your life. I had the privilege of meeting Dorothy Burton a couple years ago. Uh, she's the author of the book, Why We Fall, and her, her book was given to me as a gift and I began to read it one morning, and it was so significant to me that I actually uh, couldn't stop. I, actually, I read the entire day and finished the book, and it was a powerful book. But in that, she writes about lust, and what she says is this. Lust can be seen, or it cannot be seen, only exemplified through actions. Lust can excite, but it can't res resuscitate the part of you that dies when you trust it with your whole heart. Another way of saying lust is lust takes, but it never gives. Lust destroys, but it never builds. She also goes on to say that lust is capable of only satisfying itself. Once satisfied, it leaves you alone to pick up the pieces of what will be your shattered life. Why are we going so in depth on lust? Because I want to I want to talk about the, the the desire within each one of us. How important value and acceptance and significance is that we will literally go after and violate our conscience, violate people to do things that we wouldn't normally do otherwise because we so need these things. But there is a better way, a greater way. Now it starts with finding value, and and we're we're going to go into some scripture now so that we can make this really spiritual. So we're going to go back to the garden. This is one that you're probably familiar with, but uh, there's some points that we're going to dive in. When we try to get, get something that we already have, I'll say that lust and greed are siblings, maybe even close cousins. Greed will cause you to lose what you have in attempt to gain more. Look with me at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day... He asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? That was his first attempt. She responds, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat of it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Here he goes for a second attempt. Verse number four, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. 
So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. If you could go back to verse number four. He tricks her, deceives her, into thinking that she wasn't already like God. And so to find value, she gave up what she had in attempt to get something more and ended up losing it all. We've all made mistakes. We've all made decisions. We've all can relate in certain, in certain ways. And some of us have had weightier consequences as a result, but we've, we've all done this. And then the, the next mistake that they make, which we can all relate if we're honest, is they tried to fix it themselves. They sewed together some fig leaves to cover up their delicate areas. The trouble is that fig leaves excrete a, a chemical called Fison, which when it touches the skin causes severe irritation. And beyond that, now there's a, there's a, there's a word here, phytophotodermatitis, okay? I had to break that word up so I could sound it out. What happens is, is when the, the fison from the fig tree actually touches your skin, it goes to a, a really uncomfortable red irritation. The photo part of it is when the sun hits the skin, it turns to blisters. I'm warning you, this picture is a little bit graphic, but it makes the point. This is what your hand looks like after touching fison off from a fig leaf. Imagine they've covered the most delicate of areas. Put that picture away. <laughs> What's the point? Why would we show just a gruesome picture here? Because the point is this. When you and I try to fix it ourselves, we only make it worse. There's a greater way. God doesn't want you to try to fix it yourself. When we mess up, we fess up. We run to him who heals us and brings, brings us back to a place of safety. He's the one that we can trust. That's why I said this morning during communion, it's not that I want people to try to have a relationship with scripture. The scripture points to relationship with Christ. You should feel safe in that. When you mess up, you fess up, you get, right, you get your, 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 yourself back to a place of wholeness and healing, not by trying to fix it yourself. There is a greater way. This next part of this is when you and I try to find a way of closeness, relationship with Jesus by doing it our way. I'm going to confess to you that I, I grew up in a broken home. My, my stepdad came into the picture when I was five. Uh, I was not quickly welcomed. In fact, I was not welcomed. And I remember having conversations with my mother and, and trying to figure out what do I need to do in order to get this guy to like me. And it was always suggestions about doing something. Go out and work with him in the garage. Go out and do this. Go out and do that. And what it did is it actually put an imprint in me that in order to find value to grow in someone's appreciation, I need to do. And so what happened to me, and I think that many of you can relate, I translated that into how I'm supposed to grow in closeness with Jesus. Being busy, doing the stuff, working hard, trying to climb the, the religious ladder, if you will, so that I can have, have closeness with God. Jesus shows us a better way. In Luke chapter 19, verse number one is where I'm going to begin. This is the story probably most of you are familiar with. Zacchaeus, Jesus is walking into Jericho. Verse number one, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree uh, beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. Then Jesus came by and looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name and said, Zacchaeus, Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Half of you who grew up in Sunday school are singing that song in your head right now, right? Let's keep reading. Verse number six. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and, and I will have, if I have cheated people in their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come 
to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The mindset that Zacchaeus had is the same mindset that many of you and many times in my own life have felt that if I do, I earn. And Zacchaeus tried to climb his way up the fig tree, doing it his own way to get close to Jesus. And Jesus encounters Zacchaeus, calls him by name, and says, come on down. And what what we learn here is that getting close to Jesus isn't by climbing, it's by inviting him into your house. And when you invite Jesus into your house, salvation comes and healing and wholeness comes. Oneness, adoption comes. Love is greater than my way. Getting close to him is not the rules and regulations and the ceremonial things. I believe that why we have a mass exodus within church culture is not that people are rejecting Jesus. I believe they're rejecting the presentation of Jesus and the presentation looks like a whole stack of ceremonial things that just don't make sense to them. And so when they ask us why, we don't have a why. We point to more ceremonial, traditional things. If you and I believe that it's by doing uh, climbing the, all the efforts of religion, then we're going to find ourselves just as frustrated and wore out and eventually walk away from even attempting to be close to Jesus. Because the primary language of religion says do, do, do. But the Apostle Paul answers this with the response in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 21. I'm going to first read to you from the New Living Translation. It says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Now let me show you the King James because there's one word here that translates much closer to the original text. I do not frustrate. The word frustrate there means to nullify or to make no effect. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The grace of God is what empowers me to have oneness, rightness with God. Grace is not just limited to having favor. Grace is the ability. As I already mentioned, this Christian life is not just hard. It's impossible. It is impossible to do and to live and be apart from the grace of God, the spirit of God dwelling within you. It is not about you doing. You literally frustrate, you nullify the grace of God. And eventually, you'll wear yourself out. And eventually, like many before us, have just quit. So Jesus addresses the Pharisees, the teachers, the scribes of the law in his day. In fact, the most pointed and the most really harsh tones that we see within Jesus' conversations have to do with his conversations with the Pharisees. In one of these uh, encounters in Mark chapter 7, his, his men, the disciples, are going to get something to eat, and they come after him and ask him why, why they're not keeping the traditions of the elders. Look with me at Mark chapter 7, verse number 5. It says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? They don't say the tradition of scripture. They don't say the tradition of our forefathers. Why don't your men keep the traditions of the elders but eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, that may not seem like, uh, what's the harm in that, right? I mean, we tell our kids every day, go wash your hands before you eat. No, this was ridiculous. You had to wash and cleanse your hands all the way up to your elbows. Not just once, between every single bite. Man, they would have hate eating at my house, okay? There's food going everywhere when it's dinner time in my place. I got boys, and, and I'm one of them, right? But they, they, they're trying to hold them against this tradition that wasn't even one that was scripturally based. It was one that these Pharisees had created because they thought if you do a little bit, a lot must really be important. And this is what Jesus had to say down in verse number 13. He says, you guys are making the word of God of no effect, through your traditions, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. These traditions, extra biblical ceremonial things, so muddy the water that we miss the truth, the nuggets that are needed in our lives, not only for us, but those that are seeking for answers. We, we, we We make these people 
pile through and sift through so they can finally get a nugget from the word of God when that really should be the very first thing they're able to grab because the word of God is super important when it comes to having success God's way. When we first began Believers on Wednesday nights, we used to have a, a Bible study, and we were going through this discipleship program. It was a great time. And one, one evening, there was a statement that was made that has stuck with me. And for those of you that were there, you'll remember this very well. One of our guys was leading the conversation, and we were talking about the importance of the Word of God being within us. And he, he used an illustration of a bucket. And he said, what's in your bucket? Well, admit, among our crowd, we had some, some motorcycle uh, individuals that kind of chuckled because it really meant something precious to them. Within the motorcycle community, the helmet is, is often called your bucket. More crudely, your brain bucket, okay? And so when that person said, what's in your bucket, the first thing they thought of is, what's in your mind? But if that doesn't relate to you, imagine I'm standing here with a bucket and I only have the capacity of the bucket. What I put in that bucket is really important. And if I have it loaded with all of the extra biblical, traditional things, the religious things, the do's and don'ts, and the word is sort of in there, that when I'm in trouble and I'm struggling and I need an answer and I reach into my bucket or I reach into my bucket, I should be able to grab the truth, the the, the valuable word of God for that situation right now, not having to sift through all of this other stuff. And when I find that I'm reaching through the traditions and ceremonial things and not the word of God, I find myself very vulnerable and I find myself losing these battles. If you can relate, just say in your heart, amen. The word of God is super important. It is the key to our success. And there's three very important parts to this. We need to think God's word. We need to say God's word. And more importantly, we need to do God's word thinking about what's in my bucket. What I have is what I focus on. And what I focus on produces whatever I'm wanting to have in, that, in my life. If I'm focusing on the right thing, if I'm focusing on the word, I'm going to produce the fruit that I desire. You're going to produce the fruit your desire. You desire. Love has a greater way. Proverbs chapter three, verse number six. Seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Go back to verse number six, please. He says, seek his will. If you go back in the middle of your Bible, somewhere near the middle, there's a page before Matthew. It says the New Testament. That stands for New Testament will and testament. When I need to make a decision, I need to go to the will of God, the scriptures, the new covenant specifically, to understand what promise is there for me and not to rely on my own wisdom. It says there in the second part of of verse number seven, but instead fear the Lord. A better word should be revere, honor, have reverence for what God says about your situation. I was having a conversation with someone this past week And I I confess to them that over the last at least dozen major decisions I've made, I've not had a good one and a bad one, a good option and a bad option. Out of at least the last dozen decisions, major decisions I've needed to make, both of them were good. And I needed to know which one was God. And we don't rely on our own wisdom, but the wisdom of his will for our lives. We find that in the word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The word of God will light which path you need to take. Please take note that this verse does not say that the word is a spotlight unto my future. It is a lamp unto my feet. It will reveal what you need right now. You and I, are going to have to learn to be okay with having what he reveals to us be enough. And that's hard. That's hard for most of us. I mean, I I would love to know how all of this is going to work out in advance, but where would there be faith in that at all? Continuing with that conversation that I was having this past week, each one of those major decisions, paths that I had to choose, I had no idea how God was going to do it on the other side. 
All I knew was this was God, and I needed to follow him. Last week, I gave the example where Moses had led the children of Israel up to the Red Sea, and he did the, the, the miraculous thing. You know, God split the sea. The direction that God gave Moses wasn't, hey, Moses, raise your staff, and when you do, I'm going to split the sea for you. Nope, he just said, raise your staff. There's no way on earth that Moses could have known that that's how God was going to deliver them. Who would have thought that idea up? Oh, yeah, I'm sure that God's going to just split this water, and we're going to walk on dry ground. No, but we, we, we don't know what will come or how God will do it. We respond. We obey because we know he loves us. And my response to him is love when I obey. Exodus chapter 13, verse number 21. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from his place in front of the people. When the Lord was leading Israel through the the desert area, During the day, there was literally a cloud that they followed. At night, there was a pillar of fire that guided their way, led where they needed to go. Two years ago, maybe three, I was bringing my daughter Grace to an internship in Oklahoma. I remember we arrived there very late, and uh, I don't know if there was a cancellation or whatever happened, but we got there later than we were supposed to. Uh, Another interesting thing that I do remember about the trip is that when we got there, they had given away our, uh, our rental car which at first sounded like a drag until they said, but you can pick whatever's left. And there happened to be a brand new Mustang. Oh, I guess we'll take that one. So we jump in this Mustang. It's like one in the morning. And here, here's what I remember. And the Lord began to minister to me. As we left Dallas, Dallas is a big city, lots of lights. I mean, the glow just from the city was significant. But as we began to travel north into Oklahoma, the further away we got, what stood out to me was how dark it was. Increasingly dark. In fact, like I mentioned, it was the middle of the night, so there was very few cars in the interstate. Apart from the glow of my headlights or even the very few cars that I saw on the other side, that was, the, that was it for light. And the Lord began to speak to me th- this particular verse about how the Lord led the children of Israel with a pillar of fire by night. And if you've ever had a bonfire, it's an interesting thing that happens. There's a certain glow, a radius that the fire brings out a light in. Let's say the radius ends right here. I can stand just on this side of that radius, and you can't see me. Once I step back into that glow, it lights me up, and you can see me just fine. And what the Lord began to share with me, and what I I believe that he would say to us right now, if you are willing to follow me at my pace, I will reveal everything that you need as you need it. But if you operate in fear and you stay back here and he's moving forward, I'm now in the dark. I can't see the pitfalls. I can't see the dangers. I need to be willing to go at his pace. I also need to be willing not to get ahead of him because when I'm ahead of him, I'm in the same situation. I'm impatient, so I'm out here. I don't see the pitfalls. I don't see the dangers. But if I will follow at his pace, if you will follow at his pace, he'll reveal everything you need. If there's one thing that I've learned in this journey with Jesus, and very specifically as the pastor of this church, so long as I'm willing to follow him at his pace, he reveals everything that we need. And so that's our fight. That's my fight. To to rest in his pace, which leads me to another real world challenge for me. I know I'm not alone in this, but I I do struggle at times to be patient because I want to know. I, I'm not a tire kicker. I, I want to just keep moving fast, right? I, I know I'm, I'm the only one, but I jokingly talk about driving fast. It's not that I actually thrills me to go super fast, and I'm doing better. God is helping me. He is, I, I promise you. Well, let me finish. Why do, I, why do I struggle with it? It's not that I am exhilarated by speed. It's that I want to be from this point to this point and just be done with it. I don't want this middle stuff, but I need to be willing to go at his pace because he knows things that I do not. His way is greater than my way. Another example of God leading the children of Israel, Exodus chapter 13, verse number 17. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. Interesting. God said if the people are faced with battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. 
So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. There's so much in this, but let me, let me first start with an encouragement. You can be encouraged that if God has led you to a battle, he knows that you're equipped to win. He'll never lead you to a battle that you're not equipped to win. So if God is taking you the roundabout way, it might seem like the long way. You're trying to figure out why is it taking so long? Because he's working on you. It's for your benefit. It's for my benefit. He knows that I'm not equipped to take that battle on. And so sometimes it feels like, why are you taking so long when he's doing it for our benefit? Amen. And I, look, we, we in, as uh, Americans, uh, we as Midwest, uh, we, we want, we're hustling, man. We're going fast. We're pushing. And that's, this, is, this is good preaching for us all. We all need to slow down. We need to, to rest in what he's doing. Be okay with him leading at his pace. That is our fight. Our fight is against busyness. Our fight is to enter rest. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.11 that we are to do our best to enter into rest. There is a difference between resting and doing nothing. Resting is actually leaning in on the grace of God and trusting that he can hold all this together. That we lean on him and trust that he knows more than I know, that he knows more than you know. But that, that is a fight because we are always tempted to take it back on and try to do it our way. We need to stop the glorification of busyness. There's a different, as I mentioned, there's already a difference between resting and doing nothing, but this requires a whole new approach and a whole new way of thinking. Starting today, this very moment, we've got to stop trying to put together and working on our to-do list. Instead, we need to start working on our to-be list. You and I are different now that we are in Christ. I'm not a hybrid portion or version of myself. I'm a new creation. You're a new creation. So there's a process now of learning how to be. And he wants to be in the middle of this process so that you begin to live out of this new nature. It is our fight. De- pulling away, letting go of previous habits and methodologies and bad experiences. I get that because God is continually dealing with me on these things as well. Final verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 17. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are you. Right now, learning how to live in that is the journey. Love has a greater way, greater than my way, amen? Would you stand with me to pray over you before we dismiss? Father, I thank you for ministering to us very personally. Make no, making no assumptions that each one of us are battling the same things, but many of us battle the same methods. I pray for the humility to trust you, to lay down our own methodology and adapt or adopt your way, a greater way. Help us to know your word, to put the right things in our bucket, to think about your word, to say your word, to do your word. Help us to be ones that are obedient to follow you at your pace. Help us to reject fear of punishment, but to instead draw from your love. You have placed within us value. You have placed within us acceptance. And so, Father, we draw from that well, your abundant life, life in abundance. Right now, as we walk this out, we trust you. We lean in on your grace and we fight for that rest. We believe that and we submit to that now in Jesus' name, amen.